Hi y'all, this is Professor Trulove's Concepts for Nurses series, and I am Professor Terry Trulove. And in this episode, part of the orthopedic series, we will look at fractures, assessment, and complications. Sources for this episode include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing, 9th Edition, and Soul's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing, 7th Edition. A fracture is a break in the structure of a bone. Complications of fractures include acute compartment syndrome, crush syndrome, shock, fat embolism syndrome, venous thromboembolism, and infection. Long-term or chronic complications of fractures include the results of ischemic necrosis, acute vascular necrosis, or AVN, delayed bone healing, peripheral neurovascular dysfunction, chronic pain, impaired physical mobility, another contributing factor is inadequate nutrition. Acute compartment syndrome is a serious condition in which increased pressure within one or more of the compartments, that is the area of the muscle which is surrounded by a fibrous membrane, reduces circulation to the distal area. The most common areas for compartment syndrome include the lower legs and the forearms. The signs and symptoms of a compartment syndrome include the six P's, that is, pain, pressure, paresthesias in pallor, all found early, and paralysis in pulselessness, both of which are late. That makes sense if you think about it, because if the extremity is paralyzed and it has no pulse, it's been going on for a while. So that makes sense if you remember that those two are your late P's. All the rest are early. Other complications of fracture include hypovolemic shock, and this is because bone is very vascular. There is a risk for bleeding with the injury, and the trauma can cut nearby arteries. Fat embolism syndrome is also a complication of a fracture. It is when a flat globule is released into the bloodstream and clogs up or occludes the descending tissue. This is fairly critical if it ends up in the lung. Other sources of FES include severe burns, pancreatitis, diabetes, osteomyelitis, and sickle cell anemia. Since it can impact critical organs, it can be life-threatening. Signs and symptoms of fat embolism usually occur 12 to 48 hours after the fracture, but they may occur up to a week after the injury. It is, however, most common in that 48 to 72 hour window. An early sign is altered LOC, including restlessness from hypoxemia. This may result in tachycardia and hypotension, respiratory distress, and the classic sign of petechial rash, that is, small red dots over the chest and upper abdomen. Fractures of the hip are divided into two classifications. Intercapsular, that is, the femoral head is broken within the joint capsule. The femoral head and neck receive decreased blood supply and heal slowly. Skin traction is going to be applied postoperatively to reduce the fracture and de de decrease muscle spasms. The treatment, therefore, includes total hip replacement or ORIF with femoral head replacement. To prevent hip displacement postoperatively, you should use a deductor pillow. There is the second type, which is extracapsular, that is, the fracture is outside of the joint capsule. This fracture can occur at the greater trochanter and can be an interthericentric fracture. Postoperative treatment includes balanced suspension and or, and or traction to relieve muscle spasms and reduce pain. The surgical treatment includes ORIF with nail plate, screws, pins, or wires, basically metallic reconstruction of the affected bone. Your assessment findings for the different types of his fractures for the intracapsular, you'll see external rotation in a shortened leg. For extracapsular or thorcanteric, I'm sorry, thorcanteric, look for external rotation. The shortened leg is more pronounced. The patient will be complaining of muscle spasms, and you should be able to see a hematoma. Other complications of fractures include venous thromboembolism which can lead to deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, infection, infections to the wounds, and infection to the bone or osteomyelitis. 
Chronic complications include ischemic necrosis, that is AVN, or avascular necrosis, death of the tissue from lack of blood flow from no blood vessels being in that area, or delayed union, that is the bones never grow back together, that's non-union, or the bones grow back poorly together, known as malunion. After any type of surgical repair of a fracture, pulsion operative care should include the use of compression devices to prevent DVT, except for, of course, if one of the lower extremities is involved, anticoagulant therapy for the same reason. Be aware that your patient will probably have drains, including hemovax, and that drainage greater than 50 millimeters should be brought to the attention of the surgeon and make sure that the pins are secure. You should look for changes in bone alignment, an alteration in the length of the extremity, changes in the shape of the bone, pain upon movement, decreased range of motion, the presence of crepitus or ecumotic skin, and swelling at the fracture site. Fractures in different areas require some special considerations. For fractures of the shoulder and upper arm, assess the patient in a sitting or standing position. Support the affected arm to promote comfort. For distal areas of the arm, assess the patient in the supine position. For fractures of the low extremities and pelvis, the patient should be assessed in the supine position. There is no specific lab test to determine whether the patient has a fracture. However, hemoglobin and hematocrit and ESR should be checked, as should calcium and phosphorus, because those are indicators for things like osteoporosis. Imaging is the primary diagnostic tool use, including x-rays, computerized tomography, and MRI. These complications of the extremities put your patient at risk for peripheral neurovascular dysfunction. Your intervention should therefore include emergency care, assess for respiratory distress, that is PE, any bleeding, and even head injury from falls. Look at the impact of the fracture site for in intactness of the skin, looking for swelling and deformities, assess for the six P's, and immobilize by splinting, as that can reduce pain and promote increased circulation. That does conclude this episode. I hope you learned a little bit. I hope you plan on coming back and listening some more. And if you are, we'll see you then. Take care.